Hey, Rick McBride here with uh, your property masters in five minutes of free time. A while back we went over the contract and uh, we went did the speed version of it. Today and over the next few days or we're going to have a series going over the, the sales contract, the real estate sales contract in detail and what it actually means to you. Again, non-attorneys, um, if, you, if you need legal advice you should call an attorney, but uh, we are pretty experienced realtors and are pretty familiar with the contract. We're fortunate enough to use it quite frequently. Um, the contract that we're dealing with is the Florida Association of Realtors as is residential contract for sale and purchase. Um, it's approved by the Florida Association of Realtors and reviewed and approved by the Florida State Bar. So uh, it's basically a bunch of contract documents with some places that we fill in the blanks. Uh, we are not attorneys, we don't write contracts, we are scriveners, we just fill in the blanks. Um, it is an as-is contract. So people get that confused and they think, as-is, well, I just sold the house, it's as-is. Sort of. I mean, yeah, you sold it as-is, but it comes with some contingencies usually for financing and, and inspections as well. And uh, of course appraisal, if the buyer is getting a loan, it must appraise for whatever they're getting. So it's as-is, but there's some stipulations in that as is. It's just not as is, where is type of, type of sale. Um, I'm going to go through the lines and the paragraphs individually. Uh, the first part of the contract, it's not even before the paragraphs, identifies the party, the seller and the buyer. It's very important that the seller and the buyer's legal names be in there. And if it's a corporation, that the corporation's uh, name in here matches what's on file with the state for their corporation. For instance, if it's an LLC, you see ABC company, comma LLC, it should match that. And then the signature, the person signing the, the contract, make sure that that person is the authorized signature and, and preferably one of the recorded officers in the corporation. Uh, you will need to include, if you are a corporation buying, articles of incorporation, a copy of them with the contract so that uh, you can prove that you do, in fact, exist. Although they could look it up as some business, they want you to provide the proof. So the, buy, the seller's name is first, then the buyer, and they agree that they're basically entering into this contract between the two of them. It is a binding contract. Paragraph 1, which starts at Line one is the property description. We give us the street address, city, and zip. So that's the one that we know, the postal address. Everybody knows how to identify and, and go find the property based on the street address, the city, and the zip. Um, and then it says it is located in, and it has a blank for the county, and typically for us that would be Volusia County, and then the property tax ID number. There is a short number and a long number if you go to the appraisal site, appraiser site. So the number that goes here can be either of those, but typically when we write a contract, this stuff imports from the, from the state so we don't have to worry about that. But you do want the tax ID number in there so that uh, there is a question on what property you're talking about. They can go to the appraiser site, enter the tax ID number, and find it. Um, then there is the legal description. The legal, legal description typically, let's take a subdivision like the Barry Golf and Country Club, starts with the plat um, and your lot number in that plat and then identifies where that plat is located and then it identifies what book you can find it in in the Orlando book of recorded deeds and plats and uh, then it goes on to uh, describe the rest of the legal description. The legal description is basically a description that a surveyor could use to find that property um, exactly. And uh, that is very important because the address is not actually legal and binding. And then it says, together with all existing improvements, fixtures, built-in appliances, built-in furnishings, and attached wall-to-wall -wall carpet and flooring unless specifically excluded by other terms in this contract. So what's a fixture? A fixture is something that is attached to the property. It was once personal property and it has now been attached to the property. 
So let's take the best example of that is a ceiling fan. Usually you move in, you got a blank space to put a ceiling fan in if you didn't pay the builder $400 to do it for you, so you're going to do it yourself. So you go down to, uh, to Lowe's or Home Depot and you pick you out a ceiling fan, um, and that's personal property. You put it in your car, you drive it home. As soon as you hook the wires up to it, screw it up, and attach it to the wall, it is now an attachment. You have many attachments throughout the house, and sometimes it's difficult to tell if something's an attachment or not. But all attachments, and, and, and at the, by attaching it, it becomes a fixture. Is the exact word. So once it's a fixture, it becomes part of the property, as well as the built-in appliances so you, and the built-in furnishings. So you don't get to take the built-in bookshelves, you don't get to take the, the dishwasher with you. It conveys per this contract unless you specifically say it doesn't. You can't swap it out for another one either. That's not legal. Okay. So that is the very first part of the contract, the legal names, the legal property description, as well as the address, and identifying that all fixtures and built-in appliances and things 